نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي واجعل لي وزيرا من اخري اللهم فكهنا في الدين رب زدني علما اللهم اني اسالك علما نافعا رزقا طيبا وعملا متقبلا امين ثم امين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته today we will start with the discussion of surah al-baqarah verse number 30 chapter number 4 وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً قَالُوا أَتَجْعَلُ فِيهَا مَن يُفْسِدُ فِيهَا وَيَسْفِكُ الدِّمَاءَ وَنَحْنُ نُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِكَ وَنُقَدِّسُ لَكَ قَالَ إِنِّي أَعْلَمُ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ and mention o muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam when your lord said to the angels indeed i will make upon the earth a successive authority they said will you place upon it one who causes corruption therein and sheds blood while we declare your praise and sanctify you allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said indeed i know that which you do not know from this verse number 30 starts the narration of the creation of hazrat adam alayhi salam these events have been narrated seven times in quran six times in the makki surahs and once in the madani surah that is here as in surah baqarah different parts of the events have been explained in different surahs and all the parts which have been explained in different surahs when they are joined they make one continuous narration now in this verse we learn that before allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created hazrat adam alayhi salam only when he decided to create human beings who were basically destined for the earth he told the angels about his intentions at that time when allah informed the angels he also told the purpose of creation of adam alayhi salam that is what his role would be on the earth and allah said inni ja'ilun fil arzi khalifa that allah said that man will be created as a khalifa on the earth so here we actually need to know what we mean by khalifa because it needs to be understood as this will help us understand the purpose of our creation why allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created human beings and what was the purpose of our creation you know what some people think that khalifa means a king or a ruler it is not so the root word of khalifa is ha lam fa and it means behind after at the back so actually by the literal translation khalifa means a person who stays behind the ruler in the absence of the ruler after him he acts as his subordinate as a deputy as an assistant to the actual ruler or the head of the state so we understand that human beings were created as the wise and as the subordinates of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this earth now understanding the meaning of the word we can now understand the purpose of our creation man was not created as a ruler of the earth man is not the master of all the blessings allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses him in in this world 
in this world, man is a wise, a deputy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So like a wise or a subordinate or a deputy, does he exercise his own will? Does he carry out his own desires? No, for sure, because you know that a wise or a deputy obeys the head, the master, the ruler, and he conducts and implements the orders of the head. And as a wise on the earth, so all the bondsmen and all the mankind is supposed to do what? To obey Allah, the master of all masters. And we are hence duty bound to obey Allah and to conduct and to implement the commandments of Allah in our life and in our environment and around us. And uh, so being the wise and the deputies on the earth, we are duty bound to implement the system of Islam, the laws of Quran on the land of Allah. Now, what happened is that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed the angels about the intention of creation of the human beings, the angels commented. And what did the angels say? They said, That Allah, will you create upon the earth a being who will cause corruption and bloodshed? And you know what, what the angels said? Mankind surely did both of these things. And, and human beings have been indulging in corruption and all forms of bloodshed. Now, the question arises, how did the angels happen to know about the activities that human beings will be doing after their creation? And how did the angels get to know all this before the creation of human beings? Did they have the knowledge of the future? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran that Alimul Ghaib, Allamul Ghayub is only Allah Himself. So, how did the angels come to know about the future? You know what? Actually, the state of affairs was that before the creation of human beings, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created jinns and they, uh, they were inhabiting their land. And there on the land, the jinns, they used to fight with each other and they used to shed blood. And angels having seen all this happen on the land before the creation of human beings, when they were told that another being was going to be created and sent to the land, they predicted by the mere observation, they interpreted and they predicted that another similar being will be given this, who has been like jinns will be given the right of action, will obviously create a similar corruption of bloodshed. So it was not any knowledge of the future, but it was just a prediction after analyzing the prevailing conditions. And uh, we need to remember that Alimul Ghaib and Allahul Ghayub is just Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, trying to find out about the future is a form of polytheism. And then the angels further commented, The angels said that uh, we glorify you and we praise you and we, uh, we are all the time glorifying you. Because you know, the angels are obedient beings and angels are continuously in a state that they are praising and glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they are prostrating before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, Prophet Wasallam has taught us the tasbih of the angels. That is the words in which the angels, they glorify and they praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The tasbih being what? Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanallah azim. So these are the ex excellent words the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And after the angels, they said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are there to praise you and glorify you. What answer did Allah make as a comment? Allah said, There is no doubt 
that I know what you are ignorant of. This meant that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala disapproved of their suggestion. And it clearly also conveys that the purpose of creation of Hazrat Adam alayhi salam and all the mankind was just not that they would go on glorifying and praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There was much, much more meant behind the creation of human beings. And what the purpose was, human beings were not just created to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sanctify and glorify, but they were created to implement the system of Allah, the laws of Allah on Allah's land. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all understand the purpose of our creation and fulfill and come up to the mark why we were created. Verse number 31. Now, after the whole conversation which took place between Allah and the angels, when they were given the concept of the creation of Hazrat Adam alayhi salam, now what did Allah do? Verse 31. And he, who? Allah. And Allah taught Adam alayhi salam the names, all of them. And then he showed them to the angels and said, inform me of the names of these if you are truthful. So the first thing which I always gather whenever I recite this verse is that the first thing after the creation of Hazrat Adam alayhi salam, which was done, was what? Allama. Allama means what? Means to teach, to educate, means to impart knowledge. And how is that activity and action done? Means to teach with perfection, precision, and to the minutest of detail. And what was his Adam salam taught? He was taught the knowledge of the physical worlds and the names of things. So here I would stop and I would want to mention that what do we learn from this part of the verse? Allah al Adma Asma Akullaha being the first thing which happened to Hazrat Adam salam after his creation. The lesson and the message is. That the first thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did after the creation of Adam was what? He was not given a, he was not given an outfit. And Allah did not ask him to look after and maintain his dress. He was not served with multiple dishes and asked to eat as much as he could. And he was not shifted into a glamorous palace and asked to stay there, enjoy it, and then maintain it. But Hazrat Adam Islam, after his creation, was given knowledge. So what we learn is that seeking of knowledge and acquiring of knowledge has to be and should be the primary priority in our lives. The first human, the first prophet was first of all given knowledge, Allama. And you know what? The last prophet, the seal of prophets, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi the first revolution was what? Ikra, read. And the second revolution was what? Noon wal qalam, Allah has Allah has sworn by the name of the pen. So all this highlights what? This highlights that it conveys the importance of learning, the importance of seeking knowledge in our religion and Islam. And then what happened that after teaching Hazrat Adam alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressed the angels and asked them to tell the names of all the things which had been taught to Hazrat Adam alayhi salam. And then what happened? Verse number 32. What did they say? They said, exalted are you. We have no knowledge except what you have taught us. Indeed, it is you who is the knowing and who is the wise. So the angels glorified Allah and they accepted 
that uh, they could not uh, uh, tell the names of whatever had been taught to Hazrat Adam as they had not been blessed by the knowledge. And uh, moreover, the angels also acknowledged that anyone can only have the knowledge which Allah blesses. So remember, when any one of us is striving or working hard to seek knowledge, what do we need to do? We need to make dua. And we need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for blessing us with the knowledge because it is only Allah who blesses anyone with knowledge. As the angel said, La ilma lana illa ma allamtana. That we will have, we do not have any knowledge except what you have taught us. So anybody who is struggling and working hard to seek or gather knowledge needs to make dua and ask for the blessings of knowledge. And you know what? Prophet was taught the supplication for asking for dua. It is said in Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressed Prophet and said, Qul, O Prophet say what? Rabbi zidni ilma, that to Allah increase, increase my knowledge. So this was a supplication which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught and asked his beloved prophet to make. And in return of all this, Prophet has taught us many supplications in which we can ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for dua. Allahumma inni as'aluka ilman nafian, rizqan tuayyiban, wa amalam mutakabbana. And then, Allahumma fakihna fi deen. Allahumma anfa'ni bima allamtani, wa allimni ma yanfa'uni, wa zidni ilma. And then the supplication, A'udhu billahi an akuna min al-jahileen. These are the words of Prophet Musa alayhi salam. And uh, then Prophet salam has also taught us another supplication. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min ilmin la yanfa'u, min qalbin la yakhshau, min nafsin la tashfa'u, min da'watin la yustajabu lahu. We need to learn all these supplications, which are the supplications mentioned in Quran and taught by the Prophet Sallallahu And inshallah, Rabbi Zidni Ilma, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will definitely bless us with the blessing of knowledge, us and our so offsprings. The knowledge of Quran, the knowledge of Hadith, the knowledge of the manners of Prophet Sallallahu Now, verse number 33. Verse number 33, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then ordered Hazrat Adam alayhi salam to tell names. Allah said, Qala ya Adamu ambihum bi asma'ihim falamma amba'ahum bi asma'ihim Qala alam akul lakum inni a'lamu ghaiba samawati wal ard Allah said, O Adam, inform them of their names. And when he had informed them of their names, he said, Did I not tell you that I know the unseen of the heavens and the earth, and I know what you reveal and what you have conceived? So when the angels refused and they failed, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked Hazrat Adam alayhi salam to tell the names which the angels had failed to tell. And uh, Hazrat Adam alayhi salam succeeded in telling all the names and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressed the angels and uh, told them that what concept they had about Hazrat Adam alayhi salam was they had not rightly assessed the merit and the purpose of the creation of Hazrat Adam alayhi salam. And uh, here, the lesson, what we learn is that you can see that the first trial, Hazrat Adam alayhi salam was put to his first trial. This was his first assignment. It was an assessment by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he did what? He accomplished it. He was successful and he excelled in it. 
and the reason why Hazrat Adam -Islam accomplished and succeeded and excelled in his first trial was because of his ilm, because of his knowledge. This again highlights what? This highlights the excellence and the merit of seeking knowledge in our lives. Because you know, this world is an examination hall. Allah says, I created life and death. Why? The whole purpose of sending human beings on this in this world, which is no doubt an examination hall where, where we are all being tested, we're all being put into trial, is what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to test us that who amongst us came out in all these trials and tests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the best of deeds. So this world is an examination hall. And in this worldly life, we're all going to be, we're going to be put to trial and we're going to be assessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if we want that we ourselves or our children, we come out successful in the trials of this worldly life, what do we need to do? We need to seek knowledge, knowledge of Allah's book, knowledge of Quran, knowledge of the message sent by Prophet of the covenants of Allah, of the do's and don'ts and commandments of Allah. Anybody who's going to seek the knowledge of all these things, where Allah has taught us the righteous path, the way to spend the life according to the path of a person who is who is uh, walking on the Sarat al-Mustaqim, then we need to gain and acquire knowledge of Quran and Hadith. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in verse number 34, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Wa is qulna lil malaikatis judu li atama fasajadu illa iblis aba was takbara wa kana min al kafirin. And mention when we said to the angels, to what? Prostrate before whom? Prostrate before Adam alayhi salam. So they all prostrated except for Iblis. He did what? He refused and he was arrogant and he became of the disbelievers. So now the narration of the creation of Hazrat Adam salam, and the events continue. He was created, he was taught, and then he was put into trial and there was a comparison and there was a competition between the angels and Hazrat Adam salam, and Hazrat Adam salam, came out in flying colors and he was successful. And now after Hazrat Adam salam, was successful, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked the angels to prostrate in front of Adam alayhi salam after the first trial and the first success of Adam alayhi salam all the angels were ordered to prostrate before him what was this and uh, why was this done because you know that the angels they are an obedient being and they carry out the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and conducting the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they manage the different systems of the universe. Like there are angels for the rain, for the mountains, for the rivers, the angels for death, and so on and so forth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered the angels to prostrate and the purpose of this was to accept, because when somebody prostrates or bow, bows down in front of the next person, then it is a, a manner of respect. And it is actually doing what? It is accepting the supremacy of the next person. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked the, uh, all the angels to prostrate 
because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted them to accept the supremacy of Hazrat Adam alayhi salam. And he wanted to prove the superiority of Adam alayhi salam over the angels. And once the angels who were the who were the leaders and who were the controllers of different parts of the universe, they would prostrate and they would bow down and they would respect and they would accept the superiority indirectly. The whole universe would be accepting the superiority of Hazrat Adam salam. So the order of prostrating before Hazrat Adam salam was why? to prove the superiority of Adam salam and to prove that Adam salam and all the mankind is the superior being of the universe. So now what we need to note down here is that human beings were made as superior beings. They were created and not only created, they were proven as the superior beings of the universe. But now, what we need to know and understand is, why were they made and how did they turn out to be the superior beings? They, were, they turned out to be the superior beings not because of their bodies, because of their beautiful faces, because of their garments or their riches or their treasures, but because of their knowledge because of the ilm. So again, I will highlight the importance of seeking knowledge in our life. If we want to, if we want to come up to the merit of a superior being, and if we want to stay at the level of a superior being, we need to strive and we need to struggle to seek knowledge. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered to prostrate, it was what? It was simply a do of Allah. It was simply a command of Allah. And all the angels prostrated because as I've said before, angels are made to obey. They cannot disobey. They are not created in a manner that they disobeyed. As Allah says, yafaruna ma yu'murun. They do as they are ordered. Not only, not only did they, they just cannot disobey. So all of them, they obeyed and they prostrated. But the only one who did not obey the order of prostration was whom? Allah says, Iblis. Who was Iblis? Quran tells us, Allah says, وَقَانَ مِنِ الْجِنِّ فَفَسَقَ أَنْ أَمْرِ Rabbi, That he was from among the jinns and he disobeyed the orders of his Rabb. So he was basically, Iblis was basically a jinn. And you know what we learn from the Hadith that he was a jinn and he worshipped Allah. And he worshipped Allah so highly that because of this extent of worship and because of the account of his worship, he had started mixing up and moving around with the angels. So when the angels were ordered to prostrate, he was also ordered to prostrate. They all prostrated and they all bowed down, bowed down in front of Hazrat Adam salam for his respect and to accept his superiority, but he did not. And what did Shaitan do? What did Iblis do? Abba was takbara. He did two things. Abba means to refuse, and astakbara means to try to be, to try to act proud and arrogant. Now, because of these two behaviors, Iblis was labeled as what? Here in the verse, Allah says, Wakana minal kafiri. He became what he became out of the disbelievers. Now, I would want to elaborate quite a few messages which this verse drops. The verse has many important lessons to be learned and to be remembered. Number one, number one, Allah said that Iblis did what? Abba, 
was takbara. And Allah says, Wakana min al kafirin. That when he simply refused to obey the command of Allah, the do of Allah, he became what? He was labeled as what? Kafirin, a disbeliever. So now, remember what in the first chapter of Surah Baqarah, I explained what the condition of kufr is and what disbelievers or kafirin are. I told you very clearly there that people consider that kufr or kafirin are just people who are idol worshippers and people label that the Hindus and the Buddhists and the uh, people who worship the sun and the moons and the stars or the fire worshippers, they are kafir. And there I told you very clearly that there is no doubt that according to the teachings of Quran and Hadith, they are kafir. And this is kufr, but there is much more to it. And we learned in the first verse of Surah Al-Baqarah that kufr means what? It means refusal refusing to accept our belief. So all those who refuse to accept, who refuse to accept or to adopt or act according to the teachings or orders of Allah, they are also kafir. And this is also kufr. So now I hope it is clear that it was not, just not my interpretation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, you see, Iblis was worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he was worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highly. But despite worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when Iblis just failed to act according to the orders of Allah, he was labeled as Kana min al kafirin. So kufr is what? Refusing to obey Allah's orders. The second thing which we understand from here is that what Iblis refused to do is, is to prostrate, is to bow down and prostrate before Hazrat Adam Now this concept that when he refused to prostrate, he became what? Kana min al kafirin. He became a disbeliever. Now this itself verifies and supports the hadith where Prophet said, Bayna abdi wal kufri salah. The difference between a believer and a non-believer is leaving of salah. Distinction between Islam and kufr is what? Is leaving salah. A person who offers salah is a believer and a person who leaves salah does not offer salah in his life is who is a non-believer because it was refusal of prostration and shaitan was labeled as a kafir. And again, this also verifies the words of Prophet Wasallam. As Prophet Wasallam said, people who do not offer salah on the day of judgment People who do not offer salah, they will be raised with Tarun, with Fir'aun, with Haman, and with Ubay bin Qalq, and there will be no light for them on the day of judgment. So the whole of the events of creation of Hazrat Adam salam, and then the refusal of Iblis to prostrate, it clearly verifies that those who refuse to obey Allah are kafir, and those who leave their salah and prostration, they are kafir. And then at the third level, the whole of the event and the, these verses that shaitan leaving the order of prostration, he became kana min al kafirin. It highlights the importance of salah, the importance of salah and the importance of prostration. Imagine, just imagine and think that leaving one sajada ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a sajada which was not also for Allah, but was prostrating before Hazrat Adam salam. When that was not performed, he was labeled as a kafir. And he became what? He became madhuma madhura, the cursed one. He became what? Shaitan and rajim. And he, he, was, he was told what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, 
that you go out of Jannah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, La amla anna jahannama minkum ajma'een. That, oh Iblis, I will fill you and your followers, all of them in hellfire. So there you are. This highlights the importance of prostration and the importance of salah. That when he refused to offer salah and he any person who refuses to offer salah or who refuses to prostrate will be what? Will be a kafir, will be turned out of Jannah. Will be turned out of Jannah. And there you are again, whole of this verifies another, another hadith where Prophet said, As-salatu miftahul Jannah, that salah, is what? It is the key to paradise. It is the key to paradise. We need to realize the importance of Salah. Let's all stop here and make a resolution of establishing Salah and being vigilant and more careful and more sensitive and more watchful of our five prayers and all and prayers of all those around us. And the best advice which we can, which we can give to any one of our loved ones and to those we care is to advise about Salah. And you know what? You might find people around you who say that offering Salah and establishing Salah is not important. And it is these, uh, these mullahs they are offering, they are highlighting the importance of Salah. It's not important. You know what? We are Muslims and we don't tell lies, we don't steal, we don't do zina, and we are trustworthy, and uh, we and what not. They just try to count these ethics, and they say that we do all sorts of right things, and we do not do any wrong thing, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not need this ritual of salah, and this exercise of getting up and bowing down. Well, let us not need that. Number one, who are we to decide what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs? Who are where the hell are we to decide what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs? When Prophet said that the only difference between a believer and a non-believer is leaving salah, and when Prophet has informed us that the key to paradise is salah, and when Prophet has clearly informed us and warned us that the first question on the day of the judgment will be about salah, and then People can have such a crooked, twisted mind to say that Allah does not need salah. Okay, if you think Allah does not need salah, then what is this? If Allah did not need salah, and if prostration and salah was not important, then when Iblis did not prostrate, why was he turned out of Jannah? Why was he turned out of Jannah? And why was he made the cursed one? And why was he labeled as Shaitan or Wajin? This all highlights the importance of Salah. And the fourth thing, the fourth message of the lesson which learn from the West, uh, this verse is about arrogance. Because the second thing which Iblis did was was takbara. The root word of this word is kaf ba ra, and it means something which is great or which is big. Allah has an attribute, Allahu Akbar. Allah is the greatest. So, wastakbara means that he tried to act or try to behave great. That is, he was arrogant and proud. So, what happened? What happened when he behaved in an arrogant manner? He was labeled as kafir. He was labeled as a disbeliever. He was thrown out of Jannah and he was cursed. And he, his followings were declared that they were, they were given the tiding of hellfire. This all proves what? The dislike of arrogance. And this verifies the words of Prophet Sallallahu where Prophet said that Allah Azza wa Jal says that greatness is my cloak and whoever shall try to snatch it from me, I shall be revengeful to him. And then Prophet Sallallahu has also said that anyone who has arrogance in his heart equal to the seed of a mustard shall not enter Jannah. Who has arrogance in his heart equal to the seed of a mustard shall not enter Jannah. So that is what we need to check 
our hearts fall. People turn arrogant about their beauty, about their riches, about, about their beautiful palace-like houses, about their vehicles, about their jobs, about their professions. But now, if anybody has arrogance equal to the seed of a mustard, la yat janna. So there you are. Iblis was arrogant. Allah was revengeful with him, and he will be. He was turned out of Jannah. And uh, the whole event also helps us understand what arrogance actually is, what being arrogant actually means, because you know. A companion came over to Prophet and he asked him that we all desire that our dresses they are expensive and they are nice. That that is that we are all nicely dressed up and what things we hold in our hands they are also nice and expensive. Is this arrogance? Prophet said that no, this is not arrogance. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala does not dislike this and does not stop from all this and He permits all this and then. Prophet Sallallahu actually explained what arrogance is. He said two things. He said, instead, arrogance is what? On the nas of Bathar al-Haq. Bathar al-Haq is that refusing haq. Refusing the righteous orders of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And we know that all orders of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala are righteous. So anybody who thinks that his style and his frame of mind or his outlook to life or whatever he does or he adopts is better or his family or his society, the customs, the norms, they are better and they are, uh, they are a more uh, uh, better way of getting successful in life than compared to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this arrogance of Badr al-Haq, refusing the righteous orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is what? This is arrogance. And the second is on the nas, considering the fellow beings inferior than oneself. That is one looks down, looks down upon somebody. And if you analyze this part of the event, that is exactly what Iblis did. Iblis was arrogant. He did exactly both these things. He refused to prostrate when Allah ordered him. And that was what? Patar al-Haq. And he thought that he was superior to Hazrat Adam salam. Because in other verses where the story has been narrated, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked him that why he had not prostrated and why he had refused this order of prostration before Hazrat Adam salam. And Shaitan said, Ana khairun min. I, I happen to be better than him. You have created me out of fire and you have created him, that is Hadith Adam salam, out of mud, out of soil. And Shaitan or Iblis assumed that the fire is superior to the soil, although for real facts and purposes it is not so. And um, we need to remember that people who, all people who are arrogant, all of them, they're proud and they're boastful of things which are generally baseless and pointless. Now, verse number 34. Verse number, the next verse, verse number 35. <laughs> And what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and we said, O oh Adam, dwell you and your wife in paradise and eat therefrom and, and in ease and abundance from wherever you will, but do not approach this tree lest you be among the wrong doers. So now here in this verse, after the whole episode and the dialogue of Allah and the angels and Allah and Iblis, then after this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala returned towards Adam alayhi salam. And he allowed him to stay in Jannah with his wife, Hazrat Hava, and Allah permitted them to stay in Jannah 
and avail of the blessings of Allah. And they were granted permission to eat and drink from wherever, whatever, whenever they desired. But then they were ordered to stay away from what? Ashajavada, the specific plant. Now, what was this plant? They have been different. There have been different uh, explanations about the plant. There are people who say that it was a wheat plant. And the Christians in their book, they say that it was an apple tree. And uh, they have a very interesting narration. They say, since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, had forbidden uh, Hazrat Adam salam, from eating the apple from the apple tree. So when he ate it and he was found eating and he was guilty, then he quickly gulped it down. And uh, a morsel of the apple, it got stuck in his throat. And uh, then uh, he, they say that there is a prominence in the neck of certain people, some people, and they label it as Adam's apple. But uh, nothing of the sort is proven in Quran or Hadith. And we find no reference about the plant in um, both of the two. And Quran and Hadith, they are both silent about the actual condition of the name of the plant. So we need not uh, go in any form of curiosity and query. All we need to relate is that the tree, this ashajara or the tree, it symbolized what? It symbolized a don't of Allah. The order to prostrate symbolized a do of Allah and that don't you go near this tree. This symbolized a don't of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered them to stay away from it and not to eat it. It was just a trial. It was just a test of their obedience to show and to prove that whoever committed or indulged in the don'ts or the forbidden things by Allah, they will be deprived of Jannah and they will receive the tidings of all fire. Now, verse 36, what happened then when they were asked to stay in Jannah, then what happened? Verse number 36, <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in this verse that Iblis or Shaitan called, caused them to slip. Them means what? Hazrat Adam salam and his wife. Shaitan caused them to slip out of it and remove them from that condition in which they had been. And when we said, go down, all of you, as enemies to one another, and you will have upon the earth a place of settlement and provision for a time. So now what happened next is that Shaitan, who had been turned out of Jannah because he had not prostrated before Adam, he turned enemies with Hazrat Adam alayhi salam. And uh, there, uh, in other uh, surahs, we will learn that there was a total dialogue between him and Allah. And there he said that now I'm going to try and work out to take Adam alayhi salam and their children from Jannah also. So he started trying and working at it from the same day. Now the verse, of the words of this verse, they clearly show that the misguiding force or the agency who caused Hazrat Adam salam, and his wife to disobey was what was the shaitan. And the next fact which we also learn from here is, and we need to know here is that shaitan misguided fa'adhalla huma. Huma means two. So he misguided both. That is both means Hazrat Adam Islam and Hazrat Hawa. And this clearly negates the false concept of uh, some people who, who um, say that um, the actual issue was 
the basically the women folk and she got entrapped by shaitan and she then misguided her husband and it is the women folk who actually cause the fitna and uh, misguiding but the verse clearly says that there was nothing of the sort and both the husband and wife they were both misguided and uh, how were they misguided? It is narrated in some other surahs of Quran that Shaitan took friends with them and he would keep on seeing them and then he made them believe in how sincere he was to them. And then one day Shaitan came crying and said that I can't bear to see your state. And then he started ensuring them how sincere he was to them and he suggested that um, he would know of a trick that uh, any, any method and a step which will let them stay in Jannah and would make them live forever and uh, save them from death or exit of Jannah. And then he told them, he tricked them to eat the fruit of the forbidden plant. And what happened when both of them were tricked in a strap, they took the fruit in folly, misguided. And but the moment they consumed the fruit of the tree, which was the forbidden tree, their garments of Jannah, they were removed and they became naked. And um, in Quran, Allah says, mm-hmm. they started sticking the leaves of Jannah on their body because haya or modesty is what? It is a natural instinct. However, here we realize that the lesson both of them, they got trapped up by the trick of the shaitan was just why? Why did they get trapped up in the trick of shaitan was because of lack of knowledge. Because of lack of knowledge, if they had full knowledge and awareness about the forbidden tree, they would have never, they would have never been entrapped in the trick of shaitan and they would have never, never eaten the tree, the fruit of the tree. So they got trapped up in the tricks of shaitan just because of lack of knowledge. Lesson learned what? Ignorance, illiteracy makes a person fall in easy prey to the tricks of shaitan. So if we want to save ourselves and protect our children from the attacks of shaitan, we need to do what? We need to acquire knowledge, seek ilm of Quran and Hadith. And when Hazrat Adam and Hazrat Hava, they wronged, they were ordered to descend from Jannah to the earth. Now, when they were asked, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked them to descend from the Jannah to the earth, what happened next in the verse number 37? Adam salam, received from his Lord some words and he accepted his repentance. Indeed, it is he who is accepting of repentance, the merciful. So now in this verse 37, after disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when Hazrat Adam salam, and his wife, they were asked to leave Jannah, Hazrat Adam salam, realized his folly. And so he learned to make up for it. And he learned the manner of seeking forgiveness from Allah. So what did he do? After disobeying, after disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Hazrat Adam alayhi salam regretted. And he accepted his folly and mistake. And he asked for forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the words he learned, they have been mentioned in Quran, Rabbana zolamna and kusana wa illam tafir lana wa tarhamna lana kunanna min al fasirin. And then after that, what happened? Verse number 38, Allah said, Ullah bitu, Ullah bitu minha jamiyan, fa imma yatiyan nakum minni hudan, fa mantabia hudaya, fa la khalfun alayhim, wala hum yachzanum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Allah says, we said, go down from it. It means what? The Jannah. Go down from it, all of you. And when guidance comes to you from me, whoever follows my guidance, there will be no fear concerning them, 
nor will they grieve. So, <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then after Hazrat Adam alayhi salam asked for forgiveness, the ghafoor, the ghafar, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave them and then Allah ordered them to go down to the earth. And at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also uh, issued the instructions and the guidelines for future. And the main guidelines was that when they would settle on the land, there will be orders sent, there will be commandments given from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they will be expected to obey the do's and don'ts of Allah. And there Allah promised that all those who will act according to the do's and don'ts and the orders and the commandments of Allah will be successful and they will be rewarded. And there will be no fear for them. From They will be free from all forms of fears and tensions and worries and here and hereafter. And then in verse number 39, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَزِينَ قَفَرُوا وَقَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا أُولَٰئِكَ أَفْحَادُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ And those who disbelieve and deny our signs, those will be companions of fire and they will abide therein eternally. So in this verse number 39, Allah said, that uh, previously in the verse 38, Allah said that now that you descend to the land and you go to the earth and there you were going to get the orders of Allah and the teachings and the messages of Allah and those who do obey, they will be what? And in contrast, Allah at the same time said in this verse that uh, he war Allah warned that at the same time that those of the land who uh, in this worldly life who would disobey the orders they would be given by Allah and the do's and don'ts of the Allah, they will be inmates of hell. So from this verse, again, we can gather the definition of kufr. Kufr is what? Refusing to accept or to obey or to act upon the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, there, um, here we, I would want to mention that there are people who have a confusion. They say that when Hazrat Adam salam asked for forgiveness and Allah accepted his repentance, then why was he still punished and turned out of Jannah? Now, you know, remember what? Turning out of Jannah does not signify Allah's anger or it does not mean that he was punished. Why? Because as you read in the start of the chapter, when Allah decided to create Hazrat Adam Islam, he had announced that he was being created basically as a vice in the earth. So being sent down to the earth was not a punishment. He was basically created as a vice for the earth. And so at the time of creation, the land of the earth was destined to be a residence for the superior being, the human beings. And they were just entered in Jannah temporarily to make it clear. The whole event of this story of the creation, which has been narrated here, human being, the Hazrat Adam al-Islam was temporarily made to stay in Jannah. And the whole event made clear and the whole process it clearly elaborated that in future, in future, during the worldly life, all those who are going to accept the do's and don'ts of Allah will enter and stay in Jannah. And those who fail to obey the do's and don'ts of Allah, they will be kafir and they will be turned out and deprived of Jannah and they will be the inmates of hellfire. So, now, winding up in the end and coming to the summary of the whole chapter, the lessons which we have learned from the narration of the events is number one, the importance of knowledge. The importance of knowledge and ilm and the importance of seeking knowledge as a primary priority. Because if I sum up, the first thing which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did with Hazrat Adam alayhi salam was to give him knowledge, was to impart knowledge. The second thing, Hazrat Adam alayhi salam succeeded in his first trial when he was being assessed was why? Was because of his knowledge. The third, 
Hazrat Adam alayhi salam was made the superior being. Why? Because he had superiority in knowledge and ilm. The fourth point, Hazrat Adam alayhi salam fell a prey to the tricks and tactics of shaitan was why? Because of the lack of knowledge. And fifth, Hazrat Adam alayhi salam sought and acquired the player of Allah. Well, how? By gaining the knowledge of the manner of seeking forgiveness. So all these stages of this event where we clearly highlight the extreme importance of gaining knowledge and acquiring ilm. Rapizibni ilma. The second thing which we clearly learn from the whole narration is that to err is human, but to seek forgiveness is prophetic. The behavior and the mannerisms of prophets is to seek forgiveness. From the narration, we can clearly compare and contrast the behavior of Hazrat Adam and Shaitan. They, both of them were disobedient and both wronged, but the initial cause, the factors, the subsequent behavior, the response and attitude, and hence the final result of both is totally, and it is in fact 180 degrees opposite. So now if you compare shaitan disobeyed Allah, shaitan wronged, shaitan committed a sin of refusing to obey Allah, but he did how? He did it consciously, knowingly, voluntarily, out of sheer ignorance and realizing that he is being disobedient, he did it stubbornly and obstinately. And contrary to this, Hazrat Adam alayhi salam also committed a disobedience, but it was committed unconsciously, not knowing that he was sinning. He did not disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intentionally, willfully, or in arrogance. He just got trapped. He was confused. He was misguided. He did not realize that he was doing wrong. The second thing is that when Shaitan committed the sin of disobedience, he, in his full stubbornness and obstinacy, he stuck to it. He insisted on it. He justified it. He covered it. In fact, Billah, he blamed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it. As he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Quran, he said, that is all happened because you misguided me now, Allah. So all this happened. He said that this all happened because you created a situation that I had to disobey you. But in contrast, when Hazrat Adam salam wronged, he wronged by mistake, he immediately realized that he had disobeyed his master. And then he regretted. He confessed. He accepted his wrongdoing. And then he sought to seek forgiveness with intention, with desire, and with prayer, never to repeat this disobedience in his life again. This is the Prophet's manner. And this is the manner which pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Prophet said, that all sons of Adam, they are bound to wrong. But the best of those who wrong are those who repent and seek forgiveness. Allahumma ja'alni min al-tawwabina wa ja'alni min al-mutatakhireen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us those who repent and seek forgiveness and make amongst one of those who keep themselves pure. So the summary is, the lesson learned is that we all are the offsprings of Adam alayhi salam. We are bound to err. We are bound to err. As they say, to err is human. But the behavior, the attitude, the manner has to be like a prophet, not satanic. When we err, the manner has to be, the manner has to be prophetic and not satanic to save ourselves from Allah's wrath, from his punishment, and to gain Allah's pleasure and reward, and to get to Jannah. Rabbi
أستغفر الله ربي من كل ذنب وأتوب إليك اللهم اغفر لنا وارحمنا وأحضنا وآفنا ورزقنا اللهم اغفر لنا وللمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات اللهم إنك عفوا قريم تحب الأف فعفونا 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 اللهم حاسبنا حسابا يسيرا اللهم أجرنا من النار ربني لعندك بيتا في الجنة ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم ربنا لا تزيع قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وحب لنا من لدنك الرحمة إنك أنت الوهاب سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب عليك سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين سمامين